Hey, hello everyone. Welcome, thank you very much for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Timur Dumla. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains, also co-founder of Cradle, music tech company, and I'm hosting CppCast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers, if anybody's listening to that. Um, and today we're going to be talking about standard attributes. And it's a bit of a niche topic. It doesn't sound like a quite as attractive topic as something like lambdas or um, ranges or concepts or something like that. It's not really a hot topic. It's more of a niche topic. But um, I've done um, some work on the standards committee on this topic over the last couple of years. And I found that uh, you know it's actually quite interesting to look at standard attributes as a whole. And there's things you can learn from them about that. Uh, both about like, hey, this is something useful that I can use day to day in my code, but also kind of more broadly about how do we design C++, how do we standardize it, you know, where does this stuff all come from? Um, and so um, I put together this talk about attributes. Um, we're going to talk about what standard attributes actually are, where they come from, what the motivation is, the history of them being standardized in C and C++. Then we're going to talk about all the standard attributes that do exist in C++, uh, how we can classify them, how we can use them, how we should not be using them, you know, where on which platforms there are available, and what they do. And then also we're going to do uh, the same for the C programming language, which you know, very recently introduced standard attributes as well. Um, and then at the end, we're going to kind of zoom out, um, and instead of looking at individual attributes and what they do, we're going to look at this kind of general notion of you know, what things are attributes are supposed to be attributes, and it turns out that it has to do with ignorability. We're going to talk about what that actually means and uh, you know, how we can use that when designing C++ and deciding what should or shouldn't be an attribute. So um, I just got told that it's a bit complicated to take questions in the middle of the talk, although I kind of like doing that, but it turns out that we don't really have anybody to pass around the mics, and you have to talk to a mic if you want to ask a question. So I have the mics here, but I think passing them back and forth every time is going to be quite cumbersome. So I suggest you keep all the questions to the end. You can remember the slide number that the question relates to or something like that. And we can take questions at the end. Um, or like if you have like a really important question, like you're completely lost or something doesn't make sense or you think it's wrong, I guess you can raise your hand and say the question that can repeat it. Maybe that way it will also end up on the recording. All right, so um, what are standard attributes? Let's look into the C++ standard. The C++ standard says that attributes specify additional information for various source constructs such as types, variables, names, blocks, or translation units. Okay, well, that doesn't tell us very much. Um, so we should rewind and uh, look at where standard attributes come from. When were they standardized? Why? What was the original motivation? And it turns out that attributes um, were um, designed um, back in the day when uh, the committee was working on C++11. So this is the um, paper, the proposal to introduce standard attribute syntax, which is um, by um, Jens Maurer and Michael Wong. It's from 2008. So that's from the time when the committee was still very much busy with developing C++11 before it came out. Now, this is a standards committee paper. Uh, they all have document numbers like this, like N something if it's an older paper, or P something if it's a newer paper. So if you want to look at the whole paper, there's a way easy way of doing that. You go to your browser, you put in wg21.link slash document number, and then it's going to take you to that paper. And so uh, in this paper, the, um, this is the paper that introduced standard attribute syntax to C++. And um, it says there in the uh, first sentence that the idea is to be able to annotate some entities in C++ with additional information. And so uh, at the time, the only way to do this in a standard way was to introduce a new keyword, right? Like const or const expert or something like that. But uh, you know, some of these things, um, we don't really want to reserve keywords for them because a keyword requires you to change the grammar of the language. It takes away this identifier from you being able to use it as a variable name or a class name or something like that, right? So uh, we don't want to have an inflation of keywords in the language. You don't want to have 100 different keywords so um, for some of these features that are kind of, kind of not as heavy, let's say, as something like const, uh, 
uh, you don't want to reserve keywords, you want to have something like keywords light, so to say, and this is kind of what the idea behind attributes was. And the paper uh, contains this kind of um, list of things that they thought would be, um, you know, should be attributes rather than keywords. And they say, well, if it's a feature that is kind of, of a limited, for a limited audience, you wouldn't use it like everywhere, all over the place. It doesn't modify the type system, for example, in a way that const does or features like that. Uh, and it's kind of a minor annotation which doesn't alter the semantics significantly. So we're going to uh, look into that a little bit more. Um, and the observation at the time was that those things already existed and they were already used and they were already very useful, but they were not portable. So every compiler had a different syntax for them, right? So for example, MSVC had this decal spec, underscore, underscore decal spec syntax, which, which you could add such annotations. For example, here the no return annotation. Um, and then GCC um, had this different syntax, underscore, underscore attribute, with which you could, um, you know, also at these annotations. But these annotations would only work on those compilers, and the syntax was also compiler-specific. And so what Michael and Jens really wanted to do is to make this portable across all compilers, and to make both the syntax and the functionality of those things available in the standard so it can be available on all uh, compilers. And so um, after a bunch of research and exploring this design space, they came up with this syntax, which is the now familiar attribute syntax with the double square brackets, which I think probably most of you have seen or used. Um, has anybody never used anything with double square brackets here? Okay, you're all familiar with the basics. That's, that's very good. Um, so, and with that standard syntax, now we can take those things and we can spell them like that, right? And it's doing the same thing, but it's standard. Every compiler understands this. It's the same semantics everywhere. And so um, the grammar um, for attributes allows for two types of attributes, standard attributes and non-standard attributes, which we can also call vendor-specific um, attributes. And so the standard attributes are distinguished by having just an identifier there. So it's like double square brackets and then the name of the attribute. And then sometimes you can also have an argument list, which is just in round parents. And then uh, those are part of the C++ standard and then there is also this kind of extensible grammar where any compiler or other tool can uh, implement their own specific, compiler-specific or platform-specific um, attributes, but they go into a namespace. So then, for example, the Clang compiler can say, oh, we have our own attributes in, you know, attribute namespace Clang, quote unquote, right? And so this is very extensible uh, and can be used for all this vendor-specific stuff, but we're not going to talk about those in this talk. In this talk, we're only going to talk about the ones that are in the C++ standard itself. And so um, they're spelled with double square brackets. Interesting fact is that they're also the only things that are spelled with double square brackets. And if you try to come up with any other type of C++ code that has double square brackets in it, uh, you're not going to have a good time. Here's an example. This is actually a little bit of fun. Um, if you'd like to nerd out about uh, weird C++ code. So, um, Here's a function that has an array with two elements, and what you're doing is you're just returning the second element, okay? And so now we're indexing into this array with square brackets one, and what happens if we replace this one by a lambda that returns one, and we immediately invoke this lambda? Yeah, it's the immediately invoked lambda idiom. If you've seen my um, lambda idioms talk, you're familiar with this. And so it seems like this should be do exactly the, the same thing, but we have a double um, square bracket there, and it turns out that you get a compiler error there saying, well, these are double square brackets. They can only be used to introduce an attribute. This is a parse error, basically. You can't do this. And so you could think, well, okay, uh, we can uh, uh, trick the compiler into accepting this. You know, remember how in C++ 98, when you had uh, double closing angle brackets in a nested template, you just put like a white space in between, and then it disambiguates it from a kind of shift operator. So maybe we can just add a white space here and it's fine. Turns out, no, it's not. It's still an error. If you want this to compile, you actually have to put the lambda into an extra pair of parens. This is how the C++ grammar works. Sorry. So double square brackets, that's always an attribute. And the other important thing about attribute syntax is that each um, attribute is said to appertain, that's like standard D's term, um, uh, to some entity or statement, like a function or a class or something like this. And um, that depends on the context and depends on the particular attribute. 
And so, for example, some attributes can be applied to declarations, such as a class template declaration in this case, and that um, gets now an attribute. So that attribute appertains to the class template declaration. It's important to um, take care of like using the right syntax here, so the right grammar rules. So you actually have to write class deprecated auto putter. If you write deprecated class auto putter, that's a syntax error. So you want to, if you want it to appertain to the class declaration, you have to put it before the class name. We have other attributes like notice card, and they appertain to function declarations. In this case, you put it at the front. And we also have other types of attributes like fall through and likely. They can appertain to statements or labels, so they can appear in the middle of a block of code. And um, so going back to this original paper from 2008 that proposed um, attribute syntax, um, so it turns out that this um, list here where they said, well, these are the criteria to decide whether a new feature should be an attribute. It's mostly aged well, but not quite. As we've just seen, uh, we have attributes that appertain to statements and labels. So this original design feature that attributes were supposed to appertain only to declarations or definitions doesn't hold anymore. So we now have attributes that do appertain to other things. And the other bullet point here that maybe didn't age quite well is this whole notion of uh, um, it's a minor annotation that somehow doesn't alter the semantics significantly. Okay, so it's kind of a reasonable design principle, but it's very vague. And then it says the test is take away the annotation. Does the remaining declaration still make sense? If yes, then you know it should be an attribute. Otherwise, it should be something else, like a keyword. Well, what does it mean? Does it still make sense? So it's a little bit vague. And at the end of the talk, we're going to look into actually coming up with a much more precise uh, rule for what should or shouldn't be an attribute. Um, and they also have here um, another bullet point uh, list in this paper from 2008 saying, in which cases something shouldn't be an attribute. Um, again, this one didn't age very well, um, because you do have attributes that uh, are used in expressions. But the other things still hold. So if something is of use for a broad audience, it's a central part of the declaration that significantly alters the semantics, like const expert. If something uh, you know, has an effect on the type system, or, or on the overload resolution or things like that, then it should probably be keyword. And this is kind of a good guideline that you know, we still adhere to today. And they also um, had kind of a wish list of things back in 2008 that they thought would be very good standard attributes to actually standardize, because that paper didn't standardize any uh, concrete attributes. It just kind of paved the way. And then other papers used that and actually proposed the concrete attributes that we're going to be looking into. Um, and so um, here they, they had this wish list of things. Well, those would be good candidates for standard attributes. And two of them um, actually uh, got standardized as keywords instead. Yeah, align as is a keyword today, and final is a contextual keyword. And that was the right decision, um, as we're going to see at the end of the talk when we talk about ignorability. Things like align as don't really fall into that bucket. It's kind of funny. So if you look at aligners in the standard, it's still in the same chapter as attributes because it was originally introduced as an attribute. But then before C++11 was standardized, people realized, oh, no, it shouldn't be an attribute. So it's now a keyword, but it's still described in the same section as all the other attributes. So that's a little historical uh, side note. Um, but um, five other things on this um, wish list here actually since then got standardized as attributes in either C or C++. So all of those five, uh, we have them, and we're going to talk about them today. Um, and then there's one here, which is no areas, which we don't have in the standard, but I really think we should. And I'm going to propose it for the next version of the standard. So um, it's something that we wanted to have as an attribute back in 2008, but nobody actually sat down and wrote the paper. So I guess I'm going to do it. Um, and it's kind of like C99 restrict, but it doesn't mess with the type system. But it does tell you that you know, a pointer or reference doesn't alias another one. And so it enables optimizations in the compiler that um, you know, are good for performance in some specific cases. So this is kind of one of the things that you can use attributes for. Um, but yeah, that doesn't exist yet. This is a proposal yet to be written. Let's see if, if that flies or not. Um, and so we, uh, this um, standard attributes grammar was adopted for C++11, and then uh, that paved the way for more attributes to be standardized. And each um, 
subsequent C++ standard added more of them. So in C++11, together with the introduction of attributes as a concept, we already got two standard attributes, no return and carries dependency. Those were the first two ones. Then in the next version, in CSS 14, we got deprecated, which you can spell either with or without um, a character literal um, argument. Then in CSS 17, we got a whole bunch of really, really useful uh, attributes, uh, full through, no discard, and maybe unused. In C20, uh, we got more. So no discard uh, gained the property of now being able to take an argument, uh, string literal as well. And then we have this likely, unlikely, and no unique address, which are a little bit more tricky, as we're going to see. Um, and then C23, which is the upcoming standard, which is the one that we already finalized the technical work on uh, two months ago at the committee meeting in Issaquah, but isn't yet the new standard because it's going to take a few months until it goes through ISO and all the bureaucratic stuff is completed. Um, and it actually gonna, it's going to become the new standard. So that's like the upcoming new standard, which is going to be the official standard hopefully in a few months from now. And so there we get another very interesting attribute, which is the assume attribute. And so um, the other programming language that also has a new version coming up this year is C. C23 is also scheduled to be released later this year. And C, um, until now, didn't have any attributes uh, with the syntax at all. But C23 actually also now introduces standard attributes for the C language. And they've taken um, this subset of the ones from C++, and they carried them over to C. And then they introduced two more, unsequenced and irreproducible, which now exist only in C. Uh, so these two. And um, yeah, and I guess they're going to add more in the future. And hopefully, there's going to be some alignment between C and C++ going forward. Um, so yeah, this is kind of uh, the history of uh, standard attributes standardization. So let's dive in and talk about actual concrete um, attributes. And I'm going to start with C++ because this is where kind of uh, they originally come from. Excuse me. And so I thought, how can I classify um, these attributes? Like, in which order should I talk about them? And so it was tempting to go through them in, in the historical order, the one that I just showed. But it turned out it's not actually a really good way of classifying them. And it's much better to classify them by functionality. And it turns out there's like three different buckets of standard attributes in C++. The first bucket is attributes that either enable or disable warnings. Okay, so we have four of those. Then there's five more attributes that target the backend of the compiler. So that's the optimizer. So they either like, uh, they enable certain optimizations, they provide hints to the optimizer, they can also trigger undefined behavior if you get that wrong. Like that's often kind of the flip side of the optimization. So we're going to talk about that. We have five attributes in that bucket. And then there's one uh, more attribute, no unique address, which uh, is, uh, has been introduced in C++20, which actually can change the class layout um, of a class. So it actually affects the ABI of, of, that, of a type. So um, it's a bit of a weird, different thing from the others. And maybe we shouldn't have standardized it quite like this, but we're going we're gonna to talk about this in a minute. So we have these three buckets. I call them the warning bucket, the bear trap bucket, and, and the weird one. <laughs> and, and we're going to talk about them in that order. So let's dive in and talk about the warning bucket. And we have four attributes in this bucket. Um, and um, yeah, I don't think the gray comes out very well on the screen, but hopefully that's fine. So we're going to start with deprecated. Deprecated is a fantastic attribute. You can put it on pretty much any declaration, like for example, um, here a class template declaration auto putter. It's something that you say, well, I can't really remove it yet because some users depend on it, but I want to make sure that it's not used in new code anymore. People get warned about you shouldn't be using this anymore. So you can um, add the deprecated attribute to any such declaration. And then when uh, your users uh, want to use that entity, they're going to get a warning from the compiler saying, warning, this is deprecated. Okay, so that's very, very useful if you're maintaining a library and you go through this like deprecate, remove, add something better that replaces it kind of cycle. And it gets even better. You can give deprecated a string literal argument. Um, and I think you should really always do this to tell your users what they should be using instead of the thing that you've deprecated that they shouldn't be using anymore, right? So if you were Deprecating something is always good to tell people what they should be using instead. Otherwise, you're going to have confused users. And so the great thing about this is that not only uh, do you get a compiler warning, right? There were ways of doing this before the standard attribute, like people had 
were using hash warning or there were some other kind of more compiler-specific ways of triggering a warning. But the good thing about deprecated as a standard attribute, and actually all the standard attributes, is that uh, because they're in the standard, uh, not only do the compilers work with them, but also all the other tooling, right, like static analysis, IDEs, for example, my favorite IDE, C-Line, the one we make at JetBrains. Um, if you use um, the deprecated attribute there and you use a deprecated entity, C-Line is going to give you this nice strike through there. And then if you hover over it, it's going to tell you, you know, why this thing is deprecated. And other IDEs and similar like tools in the C++ world can also give you this kind of deep integration because it is standard. It's the same syntax everywhere. So all the C++ tools can really give you, you know, something useful uh, if you use these standard attributes, which is always better than what you get when you use any kind of compiler-specific hack, right? Just a summary of deprecated. It has this optional character literal argument. Uh, it can appertain to a class, type def variable, data member function, namespace, enum, which are actually both the enum type and also enumerators that you want to deprecate. Um, yeah, templates. Um, it's available since C++14 in every major compiler. And yeah, my recommendation is use it in your library whenever you need it. And I think it's a really good thing. And when you do, you always add the, the character literal um, argument so that your users know what to do instead of the deprecated thing. Next one is maybe unused. And maybe unused is an attribute that doesn't add a warning, but it actually suppresses a warning. And it suppresses a really annoying warning that's quite common. And it came up in <clears throat> pretty much every code base I've ever worked on. This, this thing came up. This is a slightly uh, changed uh, piece of code from a particularly large code base that I worked on at some point in the past. And so this is a typical example where this, where this kind of comes up. Um, it's some kind of callback. It doesn't really matter what it is. Some widget was processed, and when it's done, you get a callback, uh, which is giving you some kind of optional error. And what you want to do is you want to check if the error is not null, and if it's not, then you construct some kind of string, um, and then you log that string. And then you have some kind of debug log macro, which in debug logs the string and it release it does nothing it gets compiled out and you know it's very very similar for assert macros which in debug you know abort your program and print a diagnostic and in release again they do nothing and if you do compile this code in release and the macro does nothing well then you get a warning you have an unused variable and it's really annoying because the variable isn't actually unused um, and so people come out came up with lots of different hacks to silence this warning uh, which is especially annoying if you, um, if you have a zero warning policy and if you compile a code with warnings as errors, which I think we all should be doing. Um, so one workaround that a lot of people have used is to define a macro that says, well, I'm just going to cast this variable to void, which silences the warning because it counts as a use, even though it's not doing anything. But then you actually have to write the statement on used error string, which actually does the, the cast, right? So it's like an extra line of code. Another trick that I've seen is instead of a macro, you use a variable template function, which also doesn't use the variable, but for some reason in this particular case, compilers don't give you a warning. So um, it also silences the warning. But again, you, know, you have to actually know this. You have to actually write this statement. So with the standard attribute, you can just, um, you don't have to do any of that. You can just slap the attribute <clears throat> to the beginning of the line that introduces the variable, and then the compiler knows, OK, if this variable is unused, I'm just not going to warn you about it. You know, and that's there's no extra line of code. There's no extra statement. You know, it's very kind of quick to type. If you have an IDE that does auto completion, like C line, you just go to the beginning of the line. You say you know, square bracket, square bracket, and you get a pop up with auto completion. You say, okay, this one, check. So it takes like one second to type this, and then you silence the the warning. So um, yes, it, you can put it on a declaration of pretty much anything you want to put it on. Uh, it's available since C++17, so it's a little bit more recent, but hopefully most people are on C++17. It's available in every major compiler. And again, my recommendation is use whenever you need it. And if you do have some other solution in your library, like cast to void macro or anything like that, do consider replacing that you know, with the attribute, with the standard attribute. Do consider going back into your code and changing that uh, because the standard attribute is going to give you better integration with IDEs and other tools and it's going to work portably everywhere, and it's just kind of better. Um, so um, interestingly, um, there are, with these um, attributes, there are kind of uh, dragons here and there. So actually, um, interestingly, um, you can also put maybe unused on a class. And, and there are these cases with these attributes where uh, 
the standard doesn't quite exactly say you know, what it recommends should happen. For example, if you put maybe a new on a class declaration, which is a little bit more unusual than putting it on a variable declaration, um, then, yeah, the compiler is not going to warn if the class is unused. But what happens if you have a variable of that class? You know, does the compiler say, well, because you marked the whole class as maybe unused, that also translates to every variable that you declare of that class? Or does it say, well, but the variable declaration is different, you should really put the attribute on that declaration as well? And it turns out compilers don't really agree on this. So all the major compilers warn you on A1, which is like a plain unused one, and don't warn you on A2, which is like the plain one with a maybe unused attribute. But, but if you then do have this variable that doesn't have the attribute, but the class has the attribute, MSVC says, well, but the variable doesn't have this attribute, I'm still going to give you a warning. And GC and Clang kind of, they say, well, the, the attribute kind of translates to the, the variable as well. So different compilers have slightly different behavior there, um, which I think is fine. Like, in the standard, we don't really say you must warn here or you must not warn there, right? These are all the recommendations. The standard doesn't mandate anything about warnings. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think this is fine. These are edge cases that you might sometimes hit, but they usually don't cause uh, significant problems. But it's kind of interesting uh, that, that there are these cases where it's not quite defined what the semantics are. I don't think the standard is very unambiguous in like, you know, which of the compilers is correct here. Anyway, um, fall through. That's another um, attribute which is very useful to silence another really annoying warning, which is this one. If you're in a switch case statement and you have um, a case that's falling through to the next case because you don't have a break statement in there. So if you have an empty case, typically the fall through is fine. You're not going to get a warning there because that's kind of common. Uh, but if you do have a case here, where there is some code, but there is no break statement, and you fall through to the next case, the compiler is going to assume, well, no, but you didn't intend to do that. You just forgot to write the break keyword, and then you, the wrong thing happens. And, and so it's going to warn you. It's going to give you a warning. That's an implicit fall through. That's not what you wanted. But what do you do if this was actually what you wanted, and you left out the break keyword intentionally because you wanted to do something and then do something else in case one? And it turns out, unlike the other case, without the attribute, there really isn't a good way to silence this warning. The only way I know of without the attribute is to you know, actually duplicate all the code and write the break statement. And in you know, some cases like this, this is probably the better thing to do. But if your switch case statement is very long and complex, you know, in some cases, we really want to say, no, 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 I don't want to repeat all this code. I want to do this and then fall through to the next case. And so the attribute is letting you do exactly that. Right, so you put the attribute there, and that silences this warning. Um, and that's good for two reasons. A, it does silence the warning, but B, it also communicates your intent to the developers that are reading your code. You're saying, no, 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 I, I intentionally didn't write the break keyword there. Right? So that's what the fall through attribute communicates there. And, and, and that's very good that we have that. So um, the syntax is different. right? So that one doesn't appertain to declarations. It, it stands on its own as a single statement, you know, in a switch case statement, you write fall through semicolon. The standard D's way of saying this is it appertains to a null statement, where a null statement is just a plain semicolon, right? So that's a weird way of saying this is the syntax. Uh, so you can only put it inside a switch statement. It must be just before a case label. Um, it's there since it was a 17 on every major compiler. And again, the recommendation is use whenever you need it. And again, there are some fun edge cases which you're probably never going to hit, but it's kind of fun to look at them anyway. There is this piece of code, which is actually copy-pasted straight from the C++ standard, uh, which is an example where it's allowed and not allowed, according to the standard, to put the attribute. And so, so um, it has to be inside a case statement. It has to be before the next case label. You can't put it in a loop. That's an error. You can't put it in a branch. That's an error, and you can't also put it at the end of a case if there's no case after it. That's also an error. So that kind of makes sense. Um, turns out um, compilers are actually not great at diagnosing these errors. So I tried it with MSVC, Clang, GCC, and ICC, and G Clang was actually the only compiler that gave you a compile warning or compile error in all four of those red cases. Uh, the other three compilers, they warned only on one or two of them. Um, but it's fine, right? It's, it's, it's an attribute that silences a warning. If you put it in the wrong place and the compiler ignores it, 
It's not going to change anything. It's not going to break your code. It's not going to make anything do anything else, right? So I would say this is harmless, and this is exactly this kind of like example of, you know, maybe this is somehow ignorable if it's not useful, right? Uh, but we're going to get to that later. So um, the last uh, attribute in this warning bucket is notice card. And notice card is really, really cool. So notice card, uh, you put that at the, um, uh, on a function declaration. And what it uh, says is that this function returns a value. And if you call that function, you're not allowed to ignore that return value. Right? So you have to take this return value, and you have to either assign it to a variable or pass it to another function or return it. You have to do something with it. If you, if you do nothing, if you just call the function, and like, you don't do anything with the return value, you like, just pretend it's not there, and it's basically going to be returned, and then just poof, it goes out of scope. Um, that's a warning. Okay, it gives you a warning when that happens. And that's really cool, because uh, there are quite a few functions and quite a few cases where ignoring a return value like this is an error. It's a usage error of the API. Okay? And there are cases where, where such errors can lead to memory leaks, race conditions, even undefined behavior, or just the wrong thing happening. And in all of those cases where it would be wrong to, to discard the return value, you can put this attribute there to warn your users about it. Right? And here's an example where the wrong thing happens. Like, let's say you have standard vector or something similar to that. It has a member function called empty, which um, tells you if the vector is empty. Unfortunately, it's a kind of a little bit of an unfortunate naming convention in the standard library. It's not called is empty, it's called empty. And so if you're not familiar with this naming convention, you're coming from a different programming language perhaps, you might think, well, it means empty the vector, make it empty, right? The name kind of suggests that could be a reasonable interpretation of what this function is doing. And so then you might end up having a vector and then calling empty on it and expect the vector to be empty afterwards. But that's not what happens. It just checks whether it's empty. It returns a bool, and you don't do anything with the bool. So you, you get the wrong result. You, you expect the vector to be empty, but it's not actually going to be empty afterwards. And so this is exactly what this attribute is for. You can put it on that function, and then if you discard the return value, the user is going to get a warning which is going to tell them, well, you probably haven't used this function in the way it's intended to be used. And even better, you can give it a string literal argument explaining what's going on. So you can say, well, if you're discarding the return value, maybe you meant to use clear, which is the function that actually makes the vector empty. right? So you can actually really clearly communicate that to the, to the user. And again, because it's a standard attribute, it's going to integrate with all the compilers, IDEs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so, this is not the only case. There's you know, many other cases where you know, no discard can prevent really bad stuff from happening. For example, um, if you have some kind of smart pointer, like unique pointer, there is typically a function called dot .release, a member function dot .release, which releases ownership of the underlying object and gives you a role pointer to it. And the expectation is that the unique pointer isn't managing this object anymore. You get a role pointer back, and now it's your job to deallocate it. But if you discard the return value, you don't deallocate it, you get a memory leak. Memory leaks are bad. So the notice card can prevent a memory leak here. Another, um, another uh, um, example is you have cases where um, a function returns like a lockable object, and then you have to lock that in a scoped lock or something like this. And if you forget to do this, it's not locked. You might get a race condition. The third example is things like std launder, which we have in a standard library, or std assume aligned is another one of those, where uh, you give it a pointer, um, and then it's going to give you a pointer back, um, and it's there to basically prevent certain cases of undefined behavior. Uh, you can look up what the launder does if you're not familiar with it. It's a bit confusing. I'm not going to go into that now. It's a bit of a rabbit hole. But basically, there are certain cases where you're not allowed to use a pointer because of weird rules in the standard. You launder it, you get a pointer back, and if you use that pointer that comes back, then it's okay. And the pointer that comes back actually has the exact same value as the pointer you put in. But you have to use the pointer that gets returned, not the original pointer. Otherwise, it's still UB. And it's very confusing. And so if people get that wrong, and they launder the pointer, but they don't use the pointer that comes back from stud launder, they get a warning if you put notice card on it. And then it can tell you, no, this is not how you use this. You know, go and look it up. So notice card is great to prevent bugs like this. Um, you can put it on a function. 
um, also something that I learned just last week when I was preparing this talk. Um, you can also put it on an enum or a class, and then you get a warning whenever you know, an object of that type is going to be discarded. It's available since C++ 17. And since C++ 20, you can also give it this string literal argument explaining what's going on, which I think you should always do. If you are on C++ 20, it's available on all major compilers. And yeah, my recommendation is use it. Whenever you have an API where discarding the argument would be an error, the way we saw just now, use this attribute. It can save you from memory leaks, race conditions, wrong things happening, UB, or rather, it can save, if you're the library maintainer, it can save your users from those things. Um, and yeah, if, if you're in C++ 20 or above, do use the um, argument. And so uh, this was standardized in C++ 17. And then uh, uh, in the committee, we actually said, well, this is really used for actually, but maybe we should apply it to the standard library itself, because the standard library, as we saw, does have quite a few of those functions. And so we actually came up with um, kind of rules how we retrofit this attribute into the standard library um, itself which are summarized in this paper, um, Notice Card in the Library by Nico Yosutis, who I believe is giving a talk in the room next door just now. Um, and, and this paper basically outlined um, kind of recommendations when to use Notice Card in the standard library, both for stuff that was already there before, existing APIs, and also for new APIs. Like when it, we should or shouldn't add it. And I recommend you check out this paper, um, P0600, because if you do have a uh, library yourself, um, not the standard library, but some other library, and you're not sure you know, if you want to retrofit notice card into it or what to use, when to use it, when not to use it, I think this paper gives very, very good guidelines, which were written for the standard library itself, but they're also very useful, I think, applicable to other libraries too. So go ahead, look into this paper. It's going to give you some guidelines on when to use this attribute, and I think, I think it's a really good paper. All right, so now we're done with, uh, with all the warning uh, attributes. Um, at this point, um, if anybody has questions about those, I think we can do a little one minute break and take a couple questions. Um, if I do have these mics here. Okay, um, what you have to do is you have to ask a question and then pass it to the next person that has a question. Is it on? Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could add some uh, words about how the standard does uh, describe what an attribute does, given it doesn't really talk about compilers and stuff like that. So how does the wording look like? If you, um, can. you can look it up. So usually for the warning ones, it says, These are, this is the syntax that it pertains to whatever, and it can have this argument, and then that's it. And then there is a note saying, recommendation, compilers are encouraged to issue a warning if this and this happens. So it's like, a, it's like a recommendation. It doesn't normatively say you must give a warning. It just says this attribute has this syntax. That's it. That's the only like, spec that is there uh, in terms of you must implement this. But then there is this section just after it saying recommended practice. We encourage compilers to issue a warning in this case and not issue a warning in that case. And this is the way it's worded in the standard. And by and large, compilers do um, implement this recommendation, even though it's strictly speaking optional. Hey, thank you. Uh, question, I think a short one. Uh, the example was maybe unused on the class. Do I get it right that it's more like template metaprogramming techniques that will be using this thing? Or like, what is the example of, of this, of the type? Uh, maybe unused on a type. Sorry, um, didn't quite understand the question. Could you maybe repeat yeah, so, it and speak okay. up a little bit? Once again, there was a slide with yes. example of usage of maybe unused on a class, on a type. Maybe unused version. on a class, yes. Yeah. Uh, what are the examples where you're using this? Like, practical um, one. So I've not used no discard, uh, sorry, I've not used maybe unused on a class declaration myself yet. I only found out very recently that this is a thing. But I think, um, and again, I haven't tried this myself, um, if, you know, you have some kind of, type where discarding a return value of that type is always an error, that's when you can you know, put the attribute on the type rather than on every function returning an object of that type. And then you, know, you get warnings when you discard a return value of that type from a function, but also like from a cast expression, for example. So whenever you have a type, and it's an error to have a temporary object of that type that just goes poof and nothing happens with it. Whenever that's an error, my understanding is that you can then put the attribute on the type. But 
I only found out that you can do this very recently, so I haven't had a chance to actually try this out and figure out a good use case for it, because I only encountered it so far in the case where you just put it on a function, which is, oh, sorry, you were talking about notice card or maybe unused? Maybe unused. Oh, okay, maybe unused is, sorry, not on a function, on a, um, oh, okay, sorry. Okay, I misunderstood your question, I'm sorry. I was talking about notice card. You're asking about maybe unused. Maybe unused, um, yeah, you put it on a variable declaration. Uh, your question was, what happens if I put maybe unused on a type? And so I think um, what then happens is that you say you have a type declaration, but if you never have an object of that type, it's just there, you don't use it for anything, don't warn me about this. And this is what that means. But actually, I don't think any compiler warns you about this in the first place. So in this specific case, I'm not sure the attribute is going to be of much use because I think compilers typically don't give you a warning in this case anyway. But yeah, I might be wrong. I think it's a case of trying it out in Compiler Explorer and seeing what happens. Um, so yeah, not, not entirely sure about that. Like maybe I unused, they only ever used on variable local variable declarations. Okay, all right, any more questions about warnings? Okay. Um. Um, then let's proceed to the next bucket, which is the bear trap bucket. And this is where things get dangerous. And you know, so far we were talking about warnings where if a warning is there or it's not there, it's not going to change what your code is doing, right? But here we get into the next bucket where bad things can happen if you don't use the attribute properly. And so we have five attributes in this bucket. No return carries dependency likely and likely assume. And let's start with no return. No return is an attribute that you can put on a function declaration to tell the compiler that this function is never going to return a value which means it's going to throw an exception or terminate the program or do something else, but it will never normally return with a return value. This cannot happen. And if you put the attribute on there, that's what you're telling the compiler. And it's used in a few places in the standard library itself. We have a few of those functions. Uh, we have these uh, we throw exception and friends, like a couple of functions that always throw an exception. They never return a value. We have a bunch of functions like abort and terminate that always terminate the program and they also never return a value. We have obviously long jump, which also doesn't return, right? If you long jump, you then return from the set jump. So you kind of just go somewhere else. And then we have this last one, still unreachable, which is weird. We've only introduced it for the OSS 23. And whenever you call still unreachable, that's instant UB. So you can never call it. And you can use it to mark like a code path that you know that can never be reached and then the compiler knows to optimize it away. It's a bit of a can of worms, this one can be occasionally useful. Um, but all of these functions, they never return a value, and so you can mark them as no, discard, uh, sorry, no return. And what happens then is that the compiler knows that anything after this function call is dead code. It can never be reached, because if you call f, it's never going to return. Right? So it knows that return 42 or whatever is below that is dead code, because you're going to throw or jump or do something else, but you're not going to continue execution. Uh, in that function after that function call. And so, what I mean, this is the kind of optimization that compilers can do even without the attribute. If they can see the definition of f, if they can look into the body of f, they can see, oh, it always throws. And they can do this optimization already. But the attribute is really useful if uh, the compiler cannot see into the function body because it's a different translation unit or because it's too complex, the optimizer can't figure it out. And you can tell the optimizer, no, no, this is never going to return, and then it can do this optimization for you. And again, just like all the other standard attributes, it integrates into all tools. If you're in an IDE, for example, I don't know, on this projector, maybe you can't see the colors very well, but like C-Line actually grays out the return 42 here because it knows that it's unreachable code. The flip side of that, and that's going to be the case with all these uh, all these attributes that trigger optimization is that if you um, get it wrong, you get undefined behavior. So basically what you're doing is you're telling the compiler, assume that f never returns a value. You can't tell, just assume it. I'm telling you, believe me, 
and optimize based on that assumption, right? But then if f does actually return a value or it re just returns void, it returns normally like here, then it's undefined behavior, right? Because the compiler already optimized your program assuming that f is never going to return. So it probably didn't generate this return 42 statement. So it, it probably optimized it out of existence. So main is going to return zero or maybe do something else, maybe crash. We don't know. But it's undefined behavior, right? So, so no return. Um, the potential function declaration is there since the beginning, since we had attributes in C++11. It's there on all major compilers. And yeah, my recommendation is this is really an expert-only feature. If you have some of these weird functions that never return a value, which usually occurs like kind of in very kind of low-level libraries, like for example, the standard library itself, you can mark this function as no return, and it will trigger optimizations, better code gen, which might be important to you. If you're not sure, you probably shouldn't be using it. I think it's an expert-only feature uh, because it's so easy to, to get it wrong. Keep in mind, it can introduce undefined behavior. Okay. The second one in this bucket is carries dependency. And carries dependency is, is a really strange one. So carries dependency, you can put it on a function parameter declaration. Right? Only there. And then um, if you do um, concurrent programming with you know, atomics and things like that, uh, where like operations synchronize across different threads, and you load um, a, a value using memory order consume, which is one of the memory orders that the standard provides for atomic operations. And if you then load a value and pass it into this function call, um, that is marked with carries dependency, and if you're then also on a platform or, or a uh, on, a, on a CPU architecture that has a weakly ordered memory model like PowerPC, then in some cases, in this specific case, the compiler can um, skip a memory fence that would otherwise uh, be required to give you slightly better performance. If that doesn't make, didn't make any sense to you, then that's totally fine, because memory order consume actually hasn't been implemented by, uh, by any compiler, because memory order consume was standardized, um, and then we found out that, well, the way we um, defined how memory order consume works isn't actually how any hardware on this planet actually works. So, <laughs> so memory order consume is, uh, is just broken in the standard. No compiler implements it. Uh, it usually falls back to memory order acquire or memory order sequentially consistent, which are the ones that actually do work. Um, so um, no compiler implements memory order consume. Therefore, no compiler also implements the carries dependency attribute it's just going to be ignored. It does nothing. It only causes confusion. Um, there is a proposal uh, from 2018 from a couple of people who know a lot about the subject um, to fix memory order consume and to actually make it do what some of these architectures like PowerPC and, and ARM kind of in a way also um, do. None of this applies to Intel, by the way, because Intel has a strong, strong memory model. Um, and so they, they say, well, we can actually kind of fix consume in a way that it kind of actually does work in the way actual hardware works. Um, but it hasn't really been implemented in any compiler because it's a lot of work, uh, which apparently nobody wants to do in their own time. Um, and even if somebody were to implement this proposal, this is not going to require the attribute anymore, right? So this is going to work quite differently from what we have in the standard now. So, so the idea now is to probably just deprecate memory order consume, um, because it also on modern like ARM or PowerPC processors, it doesn't even actually even give you the speed ups anymore that, that it, it used to give you. So um, one way or another, um, carries dependency is probably going to be deprecated or entirely removed in the, in the near future, because it's not doing anything useful. No compiler implements it. So the recommendation is never use it and just forget it ever existed. Right, um, and now we come to likely and unlikely, um, and those are also really interesting ones. Um, so likely and unlikely, um, relatively recent standardized in CSS 20. And you can put um, likely on a branch uh, to tell the compiler that you think this branch is more likely 
to be taken than the other one, and obviously unlikely is then doing the exact opposite, is telling you that that branch is less likely to be taken. And you want the compiler to optimize your code accordingly, to optimize for that branch to be taken rather than the other one. And so it sounds useful. Uh, it sounds particularly useful for things like you know, low latency, real-time code, like high frequency trading, for example. This comes up where you, know, you want to, depending on some condition, maybe send an order to the exchange, or maybe not. But if you do send an order to the exchange, you need, to be that, you need that to be really, really, really fast, right? like nanoseconds. It needs to be faster than the competition, and then you can make a lot of money. But it's really, really important that this is as fast as possible. So you're putting a likely attribute to tell the compiler, well, optimize for this branch being fast rather than the other one. And it sounds like a good idea, right? But it doesn't quite work that way, unfortunately. So it turns out, you know, if you are in this situation, you know, the, the two things you're kind of really kind of battling against are... Uh, the instruction cache and the branch predictor, right? So you, if, if you want a branch to be taken very quickly, you want it to be hot on the instruction cache and you want the branch predictor to say, I'm just going to assume this branch is going to be taken. It turns out, likely is not going to help you with the branch predictor at all. Likely and unlikely do not influence the branch predictor in any way for the simple reason that on modern CPUs, there are no instructions to communicate with the branch predictor. So there was literally no instruction that the compiler could you know, generate from your code that would tell the branch predictor, take this branch. This is not a thing on modern CPUs, right? So the branch predictor has its own internal logic. It does what it does. You can't really tell it to do something else. Um, so likely and likely are not going to have any effect on branch predictors on modern CPUs. They might um, have an effect on your code layout, right? So if you do have a switch case with like 10 cases and you, you put like a likely attribute on a seventh case, Compiler might or might not reorder the seventh case to the top. And then it might or might not be ever so slightly more likely to be in the instruction cache when you get to that branch. So it might be a benefit sometimes. Usually, probably it won't be. Maybe in some rare cases you can measure an effect, and that's when you probably can use it. But it's a bit of a pain. There are actually two um, resources. This has been researched in interesting ways. So there's there's two resources that uh, you, can, you can read if you're interested in this attribute. One is Aaron Baumann's blog post, Don't Use the Likely and Likely Attributes. And the other one is a talk from last year's uh, CppCon by Amir Kirsch and Tomer Roman, C++20 is Likely Attribute. Um, and so uh, both of these are, are really interesting. So Aaron um, wrote this blog post um, a couple years ago saying, well, okay, so they introduced these attributes. Let's see what they do. Um, and then, oh, but there's this caveat. If you put it on this part in your code, it doesn't actually do what you think it does. And you know, if you do this, hmm, does it do anything meaningful? And also, keep in mind this. So he comes up with these like five um, rules, and he also says, you know, and actually, if you do profile-guided optimization, that's going to give you much better code than, than these attributes. And so he comes up with these five rules, and then at the end, he concludes, well, this is so painful to use them that you just shouldn't bother. OK, so I don't think everybody shares this opinion, but you know, fair enough. Um, they are very hard to use. Um, and then there is this other thing here, which is the talk by Amir and Toma from last year's CppCon. And they have looked at this in real depth. It's, it's a one-hour uh, talk just about these attributes. And they also only talk about GCC, right? So it also vastly depends on the compiler, what they're doing. They only look at GCC. Probably somebody should look at the other compilers. But anyway, they found that in GCC, yes, in some cases, you do get this reordering, right? That like, if you put likely on a branch, it's going to move, be moved up. And if you put unlikely on a branch, it's going to be moved down. Um, but sometimes, um, you also get the opposite. Because it turns out that GCC actually has a really good heuristics built in where it can kind of assign probabilities to branches just from the way you wrote your code, right? It says, well, it recognizes certain patterns, how you wrote your code. And you said, well, if you have this kind of branch, I'm just going to say, you know, it has a heuristic that to say, OK, this is probably 98% likely, and this is 2% likely. Um, and those heuristics are usually also really good. And if you use the likely and unlikely attributes, they just kind of override this. So they actually found cases where putting likely on a branch moved it down instead of up. Because like, it actually made the internal probability that GCC assigned to it lower 
rather than higher because basically likely um, in DCC is just plain 90% probability and li li unlikely is like 10% probability. So sometimes that can be lower than what GZ thought, right? So it can actually pessimize your code sometimes. And, and in any case, oftentimes you do get a code change. We don't get an me actual measurable performance improvement. So um, they are tricky to use. Uh, yeah, you can put them on labels and, and, and statements and particular branches. Uh, it's, they're there since C++20. Uh, they're available. They're there in all major compilers. I'm not sure they do something on all four of them. And so my recommendation is avoid them. They're a pain to use. Nine times out of 10, they're not going to do anything useful. Consider using them if you have measured and you know that they're actually going to make your code faster measurably. But then if you do that, keep in mind that it's just on that particular compiler. And if you upgrade your compiler, you might get, or if you change your code ever so slightly, you might get a completely different result. So it's not really, really um, reliable. And the rules to use it are not straightforward. So I would say avoid this one unless you really know what you're doing. And if you do want to know more, check out this talk. And um, you know, even if it would uh, um, you know, do what it's advertised to do kind of more often, it still wouldn't solve this problem that like, the high frequency trading people typically have. Because in this case, often you end up with code where the branch send order um, you know, is actually take, being taken uh, very, very rarely. And so it's not going to be uh, in the instruction cache regardless of what the attribute says, right? So even if the code layout is favorable, because you only rarely actually send the order, um, it's not going to be hot in the instruction cache. So, so this is just not going to solve this problem. And the way uh, the trading people actually do solve this problem um, is that they say, well, we need to keep it hot in the instruction cache so we're going to actually call it all the time. Um, and then we're going to pass it some kind of flag to say, well, don't actually send the order. And then if you're at the very end of the stack, you have your like, special network card that actually sends the order to the exchange. It's going to look at that flag and say, OK, I'm not actually going to do it. But you're going to execute this whole code path over and over and over again. And that keeps it hot in the instruction cache. And that's how you actually speed this up. But this is a runtime thing. So with compile time, things like these likely attributes are not actually going to solve this problem. So yeah, um, there's probably other tricks. I'm not actually working in the finance industry, so I'm curious if there's other things you can do. But it's, it's a big topic. And the vast majority of time, if you have these kinds of problems, likely and likely it's not the thing that's going to save you. So just, just keep that in mind. And so the last um, attribute in this bucket of optimization uh, attributes is assume. And assume is a brand new one. We just standardized it for C23, which is the upcoming standard. Um, that was actually my paper, so I spent three years um, arguing with the committee to standardize this and hashing out the exact semantics that it should have, and it was um, quite a complicated process. But at the end of it, uh, we ha now have it in the C++ 23 um, standard. So this was quite a lot of work. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how Assume works. Um, people think, uh, or people call it a bear trap sometimes. And yeah, you, you can say it is, like some of the other ones in this bucket. But I would rather call it a kind of precise surgical tool. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very sharp tool that you can use if you know exactly what you're doing. And you can reach in and do this, this move here that enables you to do something. But uh, it's, it's very sharp. So if you, if you, you know, don't use it correctly, then you, you can hurt yourself really badly. And this is exactly. Um, the case with assume. And so the semantics of assume, assume is an attribute. You can give it an expression, any C++ expression, that um, evaluates to bool, like true or false, right? So you put the expression in there. And what you're telling the compiler is that it should assume that this expression is true without actually checking it, without actually evaluating. Just assume that it's true, and then optimize based on that assumption. So it's kind of a generalization of some of the things we saw earlier. It's like a way to very precisely inject information, information into the compiler to say, well, I know this is always going to be the case that this statement is true. You probably can't see it because the code is in a different translation unit or it comes from a different, I don't know, process, programming language, whatever. But I know that this is an invariant in my code, and I want you to optimize based on this assumption. Okay? And so. If the expression doesn't actually evaluate to true, you get UB. 
It's like always with these things. If you, if you put an assumption there that doesn't actually hold, the compiler is going to optimize your code based on something that isn't true, and then you can get anything, crashes, whatever, because you can, your program might be optimized out of existence. Here's a concrete example. This is kind of an oversimplified one, but it, it gives you an idea of what's happening. So let's say we have a function that um, divides an integer by 32. Okay, it's a very boring function. And then the compiler generates, this is x86, but you could, like on ARM or whatever architecture, like similar principle, um, it's going to uh, generate these machine instructions, right? That are going to take the number, divide it by 32, you know, depending on whether it's positive or negative, you need to do some math here. What you can also do is you can say, well, I know that this number is never going to be negative. I just know this because there is an assert somewhere in my code that makes sure it's always non-negative and you will not get to this function unless this assert is true, but the optimizer can't quite see this. So I'm just telling you at this point, I know it's an invariant in my code that um, x is never going to be negative. And you're going to inject that assumption by putting this assumption in there. And then the compiler can say, okay, I can never get a negative number. I'm going to optimize based on that. So I can remove all the instructions dealing with this, and, and if, it's a, if it's zero or positive, then the division by 32 is just a bit shift by five bits, you know, which is just one instruction. Much faster, less, better code gen, right? Obviously, if you then pass a negative number in there, you're going to get a you know, very wrong result. And so here's a slightly more real-world application for this. This is something from audio code. You have um, an audio buffer, which is basically just an array of floats which describes an audio signal. You give it a pointer and a size. It's a very old school API, but this is how they sometimes work. And you basically want to iterate over this array and just clamp every value to minus one and one so that every number is between minus one and one, okay? So it's a very simple uh, loop. But then maybe because of um, the way your audio file format that you have just read works or some other invariant that you know is always true, you can say that, okay, that array is never going to be empty. The size of that array is always going to be a multiple of 32. And also the numbers in that array are never going to be infinite, none, something like this. They're going to be normal numbers. And I just want them to be clamped. And then uh, the compiler can um, take those assumptions and optimize your code and you get much shorter, better code gen. And I actually have examples in the paper where depending on the compiler, you get half or even just a third of the instructions if you put these assumptions in, right? Um, so, but then again, if your array is actually empty, then you're probably going to get some kind of out of bounds access and your program is going to crash horribly. So you really need to know what you're doing. Um, there is a yeah. question there at the back. And I think if we have a microphone, we can maybe briefly take that question. Thank you so much. Can you just pass the microphone over to that gentleman there? Yeah, just uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, what are going, uh, what are going to be the results of size being negative? If if the size is negative, what are, what are going to be the results? Uh, so it's, a, it's an unsigned integer; it can't be negative. It can be zero or non-zero, and I'm saying it's never zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Good. Um, another important thing is, as I said in the beginning. The assumption, the assumed expression is never actually evaluated by the compiler. The compiler just believes you. And, and here's an interesting code example. So you're passing an integer and you say, assume that if I increment the integer, the result is going to be 43. Okay, it's, it's a bit a constructed example. You wouldn't actually write this in your code, but I think it's useful to understand the semantics of this attribute. What is going to be the return value of f? 42 because it's never actually incremented, right? So, but it, it knows that, you know, it's always going to be 42, so actually this function can be optimized to just ignoring the, at the, 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 the uh, argument completely and just returning 42, okay? So this is, these are the kinds of optimizations you get. Very important, like the expression is never actually evaluated. So here's a summary for assume. Uh, the argument is an expression. Any C++ expression that evaluates to bool, uh, it's available, it's brand new, it's available in C++23, which is the upcoming C++ standard. GCC already implements it in their latest version, GCC13, which is, I think, coming out next month. 
It's already on Godbolt if you want to play around with it. They already implement this. Uh, MSVC, um, Intel, and, and Clang, they don't implement the standard thing yet because it's just it's very new. Um, but they all three of them have compiler built-ins that are doing exactly the same thing. So it's kind of available, just spelled differently, underscore, underscore, assume, or in Clang, it's underscore, underscore, built-in, built assume. And those have been around for a while, but they do exactly the same thing. We kind of just standardize them as a, in the standard syntax. And yeah, the recommendation is it's, again, one of those expert-only features. It can give you uh, kind of code gen and performance benefits. Um, but um, yeah, you really need to know what you're doing. It's very, very easy to shoot yourself in the foot with this. Um, like you need to know that the expression, that the environment that you're assuming actually always holds. Um, and you kind of only use it very locally if you know it's going to lead to a speed up. Oftentimes, you put an assumption and you say, OK, this is useful, but it's not actually going to speed up your code. So, but then you, know, you literally code with assumptions, and then you get undefined behavior if you, if you do it wrong. So I would recommend to not do this, to use this thing very, very sparingly, only in those cases where it actually does give you measurable performance benefits. And so those cases are rarer than you think. Um, it's actually not easy. Like it's easy to come up with an example where Assume gives you much better code gen, but it's surprisingly difficult to come up with a toy example where it gives you a measurable speed up at runtime. Um, those cases exist, and that's what the attribute is for, but you really should measure. And so uh, there was a paper by um, John Lakos and others about um, actually measuring when Assume gives you a measurable runtime performance. Um, and uh, John was actually, I think, supposed to uh, present this paper here at this conference, but due to a number of reasons, unfortunately, um, he can't be here. Um, so instead, I recommend you check out this paper. Um, yeah, and that's Assume. And so now we're down to just one last attribute that we have left in C++, which is the weird one. Uh, no unique address. And that's the one where I think, ah, maybe we shouldn't have standardized it quite the way it is. But the reasons for that will be apparent. But you know, it is useful, actually. And so um, here's why it's very useful. So um, as you may know, um, the ZBSS standard says that every object needs to occupy some storage. So if you have an empty struct, there's nothing in there, and you have an object of that type, it still has size of 1. It, still, it doesn't have size 0. It still has size 1, because every object needs to have its, its unique address and memory and occupy some storage, so at least one byte, even if there's nothing in there. Um, but um, if we uh, derive from it, right, there is this thing called empty base optimizations, which I think all modern compilers do, where if you derive from empty, uh, you know, and you have the derived class, and that one has an integer in it, for example, like that one byte that the, the empty uh, one is occupying, that's going to be optimized out, and, and the layout is going to be just the int. Right? So then the base is going to be actually empty. It's going to not occupy any, any memory. That's called the empty base optimization. Right? So size of derived is going to be equal to size of int. Are people familiar with this? OK, cool. But um, turns out it works for inheritance, but it doesn't work for composition. If you have a composed type where empty is not a base class, but a member, this doesn't work. And so MTE, the member MTE, will always occupy at least one byte of storage. And because the next one is an int and it has an alignment requirement, like it has to be aligned to four bytes, actually, most of the time, you're going to have padding bytes as well. So the whole thing is actually going to take up eight bytes, which is double the size of the int. Um, and on something like an embedded platform where you only have very little memory and binary size is really important to keep it low. You don't want that. You, you want the MTE to not take up any space. And so the no unique address attribute lets you do that. Uh, you can put it on the declaration of an empty uh, non-static data member to say, I don't care about this having a unique address. I don't care about this occupying any bytes of storage. Please optimize this out of my class layout. And so, so that is really, really useful. And then uh, Compose is going to be size of int again if your compiler supports this attribute. Okay? So that is really good to keep uh, binary size down. Why is it odd, though? So it does modify the class layout. But like every attribute, it's just a recommendation. Like in the standard, it's called a potentially overlapping object. So the compiler might do this. It doesn't have to. Um, but if it does do that, it's also an ABI break, right? So it, it, it does change the class layout of your class. 
And, and it turns out not every major compiler actually supports it. So, so Microsoft compiler, notably by default, um, doesn't do anything with this attribute. So I think they have some kind of mode or flag where you can enable it uh, with like a, I think, underscore, underscore or something. So you have to spell it differently as well, I think. But um, so the functionality is there. But if you just use the standard attribute on MSFC, it's not going to do anything. On GC, Clang, and Intel, it is going to do something. Um, and so um, mm, the, the problem is not only that one major compiler doesn't support it, but also that this whole, an attribute changing the class layout or optionally changing the class layout, it's kind of weird because, you know, remember this paper from 2008 says, you know, an attribute is a good attribute if you remove it and the declaration still makes sense, whatever that means. Well, in this case, in a compiler like Clang that does implement the attribute, you can have the static assert, which passes, but then if you take away the attribute, it breaks. And, and, and you can only do this with this attribute. So this is kind of a bit weird. Um, it appertains to a non-static data member, as we already said. Um, it's relatively new. It's available since C++ 20. As I said, in, by default, MSCC does not support it. They have their own version of this, which is spelled differently. So um, my recommendation is if you are in this kind of situation where small binary size is really critical for you and you want to do these optimizations, by all means, use the attribute. That's what it's there for. It's great. But don't rely on that being portable or happen, happening reliably. Okay? Unless you're only on this one compiler, like Clang or GCC, where you know, you know it's going to do that. Uh, and so that's the unique address. And these are all the attributes that we have in C++. And so now uh, we're going to uh, also briefly look at C. So as I said, in C, attributes only exist since C23, which is the upcoming uh, standard. Uh, they have taken, uh, so these are all the new attributes that are now available in C23. So these five, um, they have just taken from C++. They do the exact same thing in C. Notably, they haven't adopted um, carries dependency, likely, unlikely, and no unique address. And you might now have an idea why the C++, uh, sorry, why the C committee decided that it's probably not a good idea to standardize these for C. Because we have mixed, mixed experience with them in C++. They also didn't adopt assume, um, but the reason for that is, is rather different, is that um, you know, by the time I got the assume paper through the C++ committee and it was voted in, um, the next thing would have been to go to the C committee and ask them to adopt the same feature and write a paper for, for them. But at that point, it was already too late because um, C23 was already feature complete. So it was too late to propose a new feature for C. So that's the reason Assume ended up in C++23, but not in C23. But I am hoping to get it into whatever the next version of C is going to be. So Assume is not in there, I think, mostly just because of bad timing. Um, but they also introduced two new attributes, reproducible and unsequenced, that are not in C++. So those are things that the C committee actually invented. And let's briefly talk about them. This is the paper. This is a C committee paper, so the wg21.link trick is not going to work with this one. It's a different committee. I don't know how you can get to this paper. Um, I think you can find it on Google, if you maybe Google the, 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 the title. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's a long paper that's kind of detailing what these attributes do and how they work. Um, if you are already familiar with GCC uh, vendor-specific attributes, I can make this very easy for you. Reproducible is pretty much the same as GNU Pure, and Unsequence is pretty much the same as GNU Const. The only difference is that the standard ones, you can use them in a few extra situations where the GNU ones, you can't use them. So they're slightly more permissive in the sense of like where you can use them. But the semantics are the same, pretty much. Um, and so what do they do? So um, they're also in this kind of optimization bucket. Um, and so um, much like the no return uh, attribute, you can put it on a function declaration to signal to the compiler that your function has certain properties. Okay? And so these are four uh, properties that a function might have, which are useful to define. A function can be stateless, which means that it doesn't define any a uh, mutable static variable inside, you know, which can change value next time you call it, or thread local objects. A function can be effectless, which means that it might return a value, but it doesn't have any side effects apart from that. Like, it doesn't gonna, it's not going to print to see out. It's not going to uh, change the value of a global variable. It, it doesn't have any observable side effects. It only returns a value. 
The third property, which is really important, is idempotent, which means that if you call a function multiple times with the same input, it's going to give you the same output. Yeah, that's a really important property. And the last one is independent. It means that the result of what the function is going to return you doesn't depend on any outside state. So basically, it doesn't depend when you call the function, like before this thing or after this thing. It's going to give you the same result because it doesn't depend on any other kind of state outside of the function itself. Um, and so these are four useful properties that you can define. And then basically, these two attributes combine them um, and you can mark a function as reproducible to say it's effectless and idempotent. And you can mark a function as unsequenced to say that it's stateless, effectless, idempotent, and independent. So it has all four of these properties at once. And those are really good and useful properties to tell the compiler about because it enables really interesting optimizations. Um, consider, for example, you know, some kind of math uh, library which gives you functions like cosine. Like most math functions will typically have you know, all four of these properties. Um, and then um, let's say you, you're doing some equation, whatever, you're calling a cosine uh, four times to evaluate some condition. And then what the compiler is going to do, it's going to um, evaluate, it's going to call cosine four times, right? But if you mark cosine as unsequenced, the compiler can go ahead and say, oh, you're calling cosine twice with the same argument. I know you're going to get the same result both times. So I can optimize away the second call and just reuse the result from the first call. And you're going to get three calls instead of four. And cosine is potentially a very expensive function call, right? So, so it's a really, really good optimization. And again, just like with the other stuff, in a lot of cases, if the compiler sees the definition of the function and it's sufficiently simple that the optimizer can reason about it, it can already do these optimizations. But if the function is too complex and the compiler can't prove that it's unsequenced, or if the function is in a different translation unit, right, then the, the optimizer doesn't see it. And then it can't do the optimization. But then with the attribute, you can tell it, I know this function is unsequenced. You can do this optimization. Please trust me. And so um, it's like with assume or no return. The compiler is not required to check this. Typically, it won't. Sometimes, I guess, in, in easy cases, if you put unsequenced or reproducible on a function that doesn't have the property, and the compiler sees the code, and it can tell you, you got this wrong, this function has a side effect, you might get a warning, but most of the time you won't. So it's this kind of thing where the compiler is going to believe you, it's going to optimize based on that assumption, and if you got it wrong, and the function doesn't actually have the property that the attribute says it does, you're going to get undefined behavior. Okay? And so, yeah. Syntax, again, as appertains to function declarations, its availability is since C23, so brand new. As of now, it's only in C. It's not in C++. It's not going to be in C++23. Um, I'm going to um, um, see if I can help get this into C++. So I've been in touch with the people who wrote this paper for C. They said they are interested to put, putting it in C++. I've done some work on attributes. Maybe I can help them make this happen. So maybe I'm going to get this in C++26 hopefully, but time will tell. Um, there are no implementations of this, as far as I know, because it's brand new. But you see in Clang have GNU Pure and GNU Const, which pretty much do the same thing, just spelled differently. And so the recommendation is very much like with Assume, only use it if you know what you're doing. Um, I wouldn't put it quite as strictly as with Assume, because um, with Assume, I'd say, just by default, don't use it unless you really, really know what you're doing. You've measured it. Here, I think I can relax this a little bit because there are lots of functions like math functions where it's kind of obvious that they have these properties. So you, you, can, you can use these, these um, attributes um, if you're sure, but um, yeah, beware, you do get UB if, um, if you get it wrong. And I think maybe the consequences of that UB might be slightly less bad like with, than with assume. With assume, literally anything can happen. I think with this kind of UB here, it's just not going to call your function as many times as you know you wrote it. So if it has side effects, it's not gonna you're not gonna observe them as many times as you would otherwise. So I think this is the worst thing that can happen. But I don't know. I'm not a compiler engineer. Maybe you can get worse optimizations that break more stuff and you get worse UB with this as well. I don't know. I need to play around with these. But yeah, don't get it wrong, please. Use them in the way they're supposed to be used. 
um, all right, and that's all the um, attributes that we have in C and C++. So uh, with that, um, I have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to very quickly uh, go through the very last question, uh, very last section of the talk where we kind of zoom out and look at attributes as a whole. And so um, we've seen what these attributes do and how they behave, and you've seen that pretty much all of them are ignorable in a sense that um, the compiler might or might not do the thing that they're supposed to do, and it's still conforming with the standard. The standard doesn't say you must do this. It says optimize if you can, you know, maybe give a warning here or don't give a warning there. It's not really... So, um, so a lot of people, they have this idea that if you want to, if you like, if people come to the committee, the CSS committee with a new feature uh, proposal, um, then oftentimes you have this discussion. Should it be an attribute? Should it be a keyword? How do we decide? And we have this discussion over and over again. And, and um, you know, people have this idea that if it's ignorable, it's an attribute perhaps, but it's not really defined anywhere what that means, or it wasn't until recently. So, so what I kind of want to do is uh, look at this and actually come up with kind of solid rules. And so the original paper in 2008 very vaguely spoke about something that doesn't alter the semantics significantly and the remaining declaration still makes sense if you remove it. Well, that's very vague. So I actually wrote this paper, which we spent quite some time looking at in the C++ uh, committee on the ignorability of standard attributes to actually nail this down and say, okay, these are the rules for when something is a good attribute, basically. And so the questions that this paper aims to answer is, is a compiler allowed to ign just ignore any of these attributes? And, and what does it mean to ignore a standard attribute? And so the C uh, standard says this. It says, standard attributes specified by this document can be passed but ignored, which kind of is a contradiction in itself. You're parsing it, you're not ignoring it. If you have an assume, for example, it has an expression inside. If you're parsing the expression, you already are using the variables in that expression that can trigger lambda captures, that can trigger template instantiations. Those are things that are observable in your code, right? If you're parsing something, you're not ignoring it. Ignoring would be double square brackets, just skip all the way to the end of the closing double square brackets. That's ignoring. But the C standard doesn't really say if this is what they mean. Probably not. The C++ standard, until recently in C++20, um, wasn't really better. It actually was also very ambiguous in a different way. It says, for an attribute token not specified in this document, so these are like the non-standard ones, like GNU colon colon, right? The behavior implementation defined, okay, makes sense. If you have a vendor-specific attribute, the vendor needs to specify what it does. But then it says, any attribute token that is not recognized by the implementation is ignored. Any attribute token not specified in this document, which is what the previous sentence was referring to, or any attribute token including those specified in this document, which are the standard ones. Are you allowed to ignore them as well? And this is kind of the, these are kind of the wording problems that we, we have to deal with if, if you look at the, standard, the C++ standard and something is ambiguous there. You have to precisely state what you mean. And this is the case where the C++ 20 wasn't doing that. And so I looked at this a little bit closer and figured out that there's actually two ways in which you can ignore something. There is semantic ignorability, syntactic ignorability, and semantic ignorability. So you can ignore the syntax, and you can ignore the semantics. If you ignore the syntax, basically you're saying, so the syntax is what can be in these double square brackets, or where can the attribute be, where can it appertain to? And so the standard says, well, for example, um, no return must appertain to a function declaration. If it appertains to something else, it's a syntax error. Or assume has an expression which is convertible to bool, or de deprecated has an uh, uh, argument that is a string literal. If it's something else, it's a syntax error. Your program is, is ill-formed. But then at the same time, the other sentence says, but maybe you can ignore all of this. So the question is, if you have you know, no unique address and you put it on a local variable, which doesn't make any sense, is this an error? or? Or is I we allowed to just ignore this? If we, like, is the compiler just allowed to ignore this because attributes are ignorable? If you have an assume with a broken expression, a modulo nothing, is that a syntax error? Or can the compiler just say, well, I'm just going to ignore this. Is, this? is this valid? And if the assume uh, you know, has an expression in there that triggers a template instantiation, and that triggers a static assert, is the compiler required to give you an error to say that the static assert has failed, or is it allowed to skip this? Like, for example, a compiler might 
decide to not implement assumptions for optimization. Like compiler maybe, oh, like actually I heard from one of the four uh, big uh, compilers that they say, well, maybe we're not going to implement the optimizations. We're not sure if, if you know, this is the right thing for our compiler. Maybe we're just going to ignore, you know, we're going to take the assumption and just not do anything with it, which is fine. But do you still have to parse it? Do you still have to give the diagnostic for the failed static assert? The standard doesn't say. Or it did not say um, in C++ 20, we talked a lot about this and we decided to fix this. And so now C++ 23, as of a couple months ago, actually says any such attribute token, which means not, not specified in this document. And we actually added a note saying, well, but for standard attributes, the syntax rules are the syntax rules. If you break the syntax rules, it's a compiler error, okay? So you must parse it. If it's in the wrong place or if the expression is not formed, you must diagnose this. It is a compiler error. And the standard in C++ 13 now says this. Right, so we figured out syntactic ignorability. Basically, no, standard attributes are not syntactically ignorable. But are they semantically ignorable? And it turns out, they already are semantically ignorable implicitly, right? Every attribute that we talked about is defined in a way that the semantics, what it does, can be ignored, right? So deprecated fall through maybe and use notice card, those are the ones that deal with warnings. The standard doesn't mandate warnings. It just recommends, right? This was a question earlier. It just recommends to give or not give a warning. You, the compiler can ignore it and still be conformant with the standard. Uh, same with optimization hints. We cannot require in the standard that something is going to be optimized, right? We can encourage the compiler to optimize it. We can allow it to say, you know, it's undefined behavior otherwise, which is the thing that kind of allows the compiler to optimize based on that assumption, but we can't mandate it. Like we don't spell out in the standard how the optimizer works. So it's always going to be a valid implementation for all of these to just ignore them, right? Um, same for the ones that, you know, turn well-defined into undefined behavior, like no return or assume, or like the new C ones, if you get it wrong. Um, well, if it's undefined behavior, then ignoring the attribute and doing the thing that you would be doing otherwise is also a valid implementation of undefined behavior, right? Because undefined behavior doesn't tell you what, what's supposed to happen. So again, you can ignore the attribute. Um, you Knowing you could rest is kind of weird, but like it is specifically because there was, I think, some wrangling about like, should it be an attribute, should it not be an attribute, should it be a keyword? And then we said, okay, okay, it's going to be an attribute, but it's going to be optional. So we invented this, this term of potentially overlapping subobjects. So this like size optimization, we say it's optional. Like the compiler doesn't have to do it, and the Microsoft compiler notably doesn't do it, right? So, so that's why people say, well, they have this like, concept in their heads that um, attributes are ignorable. But what does that mean? Like some people think, well, it means that the program has the same behavior or the same semantics, right, with or without, which is clearly not true. Now, if you add no return, it can turn a valid program into UB, which is clearly not the same semantics. So this rule doesn't work. Uh, a much better formulation of this rule, which still isn't right, but a lot of people think that it is, is, well, if you already have a well-formed program with the attribute, with well-defined behavior, no UB, you know, and then you take away the attribute, then it has the same behavior or the same semantics as, as with the attribute. And it would work, except we have no unique address, which doesn't work. So, right? so you have this case where you take away no unique address and main returns a different value. Or if you turn this into a static assert, you can construct a case where you take away the, static, uh, the no unique address and then the program no longer compiles. That rule also clearly doesn't work. And the problem is that we don't really say what it means to change the behavior or the semantics of the code. And so here's the rule that I propose, which I think is a lot more precise. Given a well-formed program, removing all instances um, of a particular attribute results in a program whose observable behavior is a conforming realization of the original program. And I'm going to make this red. This is like the most important slide here, right? So this is kind of the new rule in English. And what it means is that if you take away the attribute, it doesn't have, the program doesn't have to have the same behavior as before. But it needs to be a behavior that would have been standard conforming with the attribute as well. And so um, we just added this to C++23 at the very last minute um, at the last committee meeting. And this is a slightly more mathematical, more precise formulation of the same rule, uh, which says 
Attributes specified in the standard have optional semantics. Given a well from program, removing all instances of any one of those attributes results in a program whose set of possible executions for a given input is a subset of those of the original program. So it's like a more mathematical standardized way of saying the same thing. I think I'm going to overrun by a couple of minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Um, is that okay? You, if, you, if you have to go somewhere, you can, you can leave. Um, but I need a couple more minutes to finish these slides. So, so, so what does that mean? Well, it means, um, you know, we kind of have these layers of, of like, behavior in the standard. And it's like a whole other talk to actually talk about what these exactly mean. But very briefly, kind of mandated behavior is the standard says that this is what happens. Like, 1 plus 1 equals 2, right? There's no wiggle room here. If, you, if 1 plus 1 isn't 2, the compiler isn't conforming to the standard. Then we have this concept of implementation behavior, implementation-defined behavior, where it's like, OK, it's either A or B. And you know, the compiler has to document which one it is. Then there's unspecified behavior, which is something happens. We don't specify which. It could be anything. And then we have undefined behavior, which is even worse than this, which is, and also, so anything can happen. And also, if you ever hit this, your whole program is invalid. And the optimizer can do whatever it wants. And you, you, know, you get what you get. And so this rule basically says, well, you have these different options, right? If you have mandated behavior, this is the only thing that can happen. If you have implementation-defined behavior, it could be either A or B. And if you have an attribute, you know, you can have behavior A or B, and maybe you have behavior A with the attribute. You take the attribute away, you get behavior B. But behavior B would have been an acceptable implementation with the attribute as well. Right? And that's what, that's what this rule means. I hope this makes, this makes sense. And so, uh, basically, we got this rule in CSS23, so I think we solved this issue. We don't have to talk ever again about should this feature be an attribute, because you have defined precisely you know, what good attributes should behave like. And so there's this one last thing which we need to fix, which is has CPP attribute. It's a, it's a feature test macro that you can use uh, to see if your compiler supports a given attribute. Okay? And so you use this in things like this, where um, you want to use the standard attribute if it's there, and if it's not there, uh, you want to fall back to whatever compiler-specific workaround there is, right? And, and this is quite common to have these ugly macros that do this, right? You want to check at compile time, does my compiler support assume? If it does, you use it. If not, your macro just does something else depending on what, that gives you the same semantics based on the, the, the compiler you're on. And then um, the standard says, well, what is the value of this, of this macro? And it says, the standard says in one place, the value of this macro is this. It's a positive value, right? So if your compiler is conforming, it always passes. But then in the pre previous sentence, it says, well, but only if an implementation supports the attribute. What does it mean, support the attribute? Like, do you, if you just pass it, but then ignore it, do you support it? Or do you actually support the semantics of it? Like, if you pass the assume, but then throw it away, do you support it? And so I looked at this, um, kind of like, does the attribute do the thing that it's supposed to do on all the compilers? The, the question marks meant it probably does, but I just couldn't reproduce a case where I could observe this. Um, and so it turns out no compiler implements carries dependency. And also, Microsoft doesn't implement no unique address. But if you ask the macro, do you support the attribute, you get this answer here on the right. And so it's actually quite inconsistent. Uh, so. Um, on the one hand, um, in these two cases, the compiler doesn't do anything with the attribute and reports I don't support it. But in these other three cases, the compiler also doesn't do any, anything with the attribute, but, it, but it, it reports that it supports it. So this is the case where the compiler says, I'm, not, I'm parsing it but not doing anything with it. I'm not doing the thing, so false. In this case, is, I'm not doing the thing, but I'm still parsing it. So it's a valid implementation of the attribute. So I'm going to return true. So it's kind of... Which one is it? And the, the, the standard is, is un ambiguous on this point. And, but if you write these macros, which we unfortunately have to do, if you write portable code, um, what you really want is you want to ask the compiler, are you doing the thing that you're supposed to do? Are you actually doing the optimization? And if not, you know, I'm going to use this other thing to get what I want. And so I think these things should be compiler bugs, not the other ones. Right. So if you don't do anything with an attribute, you should report that you don't do anything with them. So the, ma the macro should return zero. And so I'm going to write a, um, or I'm in the process of writing an, an R2 revision of this paper, which actually also fixes the, 
has the PP attribute thing, which unfortunately we didn't get in C++23, but hopefully we will get um, in, the next, in the next revision. So this paper will propose that this macro should have a positive value only if the compiler does the thing with the attribute, right? And so it's going to be tricky to formulate that, but let's see. Uh, but this is really what you want if you want to do these things, right? And so um, this is all I have. Um, here's some future work, some homework for me. So I want to, as I said, fix the HACCPP attribute. I would like to get assume into C. Um, I would like to get unsequenced and reproducible into C++. And another thing, piece of homework that I'd like to do is I would like to propose this no alias attribute, which I think is also going to be very useful for optimizations. And um, this is all I have on standard attributes. Thank you very much. And sorry for overrunning by five minutes. Um, I don't think we have time for questions, but I'm going to be here so you can ask me. If I may just say one brief thing before you all go. ACCU is awesome. It's a great conference. It's not the only conference in the UK. Um, there's also CPP on C, which is happening in June. Um, I am giving another talk about a completely different topic um, at CPP on C. I'm going to talk about C++ and safety, uh, which also has to do with undefined behavior, but like in a different way. And for this talk, I'm doing a little experiment. So I'm doing a little survey where I'm, I want to find out like, what people think about undefined behavior. And so for that, I've set up a little survey which has three simple questions, and actually two of them, only two of them are mandatory, one of them is optional. So it takes one minute to fill this out. It's anonymous, I'm not collecting anybody's email. It's a little experiment to like, see what happens, and I'm going to reveal the, the results at the CPP on C talk. And so you can get to it either through tmod.audio slash survey or through this QR code, and you would really, really help me if you would go there, fill out the survey, and let me know what you think about undefined behavior. And as I said, it's only three quick questions, and one of them is optional, so it takes two minutes. But yeah, please fill out the survey, and I'm going to reveal the results in June. Thank you so much.